Lana pushed open the door to the cottage she'd rented through Airbnb, her breath fogging in the icy air. The listing had promised a cozy, secluded getaway in the heart of the Vermont woods, perfect for a writer looking to finish her novel. The reality was a dilapidated cabin that looked untouched for decades, shrouded in dense mist and an unsettling silence. She stepped inside, the floorboards creaking ominously under her weight. The cottage was chilly, the only warmth emanating from a flickering light bulb that cast eerie shadows on the walls. Lana shivered, not just from the cold, but from the feeling that she wasn't alone. Determined to make the best of it, she unpacked her things, set up her laptop, and tried to settle in. The wind howled outside, branches tapping against the windows like skeletal fingers. Lana tried to focus on her writing, but the atmosphere of the cabin made her thoughts drift to darker narratives. As night fell, Lana prepared a simple meal in the quaint kitchen. That's when she noticed the small, black and white photos tacked to the fridge, pictures of different guests, their faces blurred and expressions distorted. Unease twisted in her gut, but she dismissed it as the product of an overactive imagination. Retiring early to the bedroom, Lana found it hard to sleep. The bed was stiff, the pillows flat, and there was a persistent scratching sound coming from the walls. She tossed and turned, her mind teeming with horror stories she'd read about other Airbnb nightmares. Finally, sleep claimed her. She awoke suddenly in the dead of night, her heart racing. The room was pitch black, the winds howl louder than before, and the scratching had grown more frantic. Lana fumbled for her phone, the screen lit up to show 3.33 a.m. The eerie specificity of the time sent a chill down her spine. Deciding she needed a drink of water to calm her nerves, Lana headed to the kitchen. That's when she noticed it, the largest photo on the fridge now showed her sleeping in the bed, a figure lurking in the doorway barely visible in the dark room. Lana gasped, dropping her phone. The screen shattered, plunging her back into darkness. Her breath came quick and shallow as she backed away slowly. The floorboard squeaked sharply behind her, and she whirled around, but there was nothing. Just the empty, dark hallway and the oppressive feel of unseen eyes watching her. Heart pounding, Lana decided she had to leave, even if it meant braving the midnight forest. She grabbed her keys, her coat, her bag, but as she turned to the door, it slammed shut by itself, the lock clicking ominously. Panic surged. Trapped and terrified, Lana searched for another way out. The only other exit was a small, ground floor window in the bathroom. She rushed to it, struggling to pry it open, but it was painted shut. As she wrestled with the stubborn window, a low, guttural moan echoed through the house, sending a wave of terror through her. She spun around to see the shadowy figure from the photo standing at the end of the hallway, barely discernible in the dark. It moved towards her, slow and deliberate, its features obscured but its intentions clear. Lana screamed, throwing whatever she could find at the figure. The items passed through it, hitting the wall behind. It was then she realized, with horror, that this wasn't a person, this was something else. Something that wasn't supposed to exist. Frantic, she redoubled her efforts on the window, tears streaming down her face as she heard the figure drawing closer, its moans now a chorus of whispers, unintelligible and chilling. Just as the figure reached out with a hand that seemed more mist than flesh, the window gave way under Lana's desperate strength. She tumbled out into the cold, the ground hard against her, the mist enveloping her like a shroud. Panting, hurt, and terrified, Lana ran through the dark woods, the cottage disappearing behind her, its secrets swallowed by the fog. The forest seemed endless, the trees like specters in the night. Lana's mind raced as she navigated through the darkness, every rustle and crack making her jump. She didn't know where she was going, only that she needed to get away. But as the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, Lana stumbled upon a startling discovery, a circle of old, stone cottages, identical to the one she had rented, each one decrepit and seemingly abandoned. 
and in the center of the circle, a stone well, its depths black and impenetrable. Lana approached the well, her curiosity battling her fear. She peered into the darkness, and that's when she heard it, a whisper, coming from the depths, calling her name. The voice was familiar, too familiar. It sounded like her own, but distorted, as if underwater. Lana recoiled, her heart pounding against her ribcage. The whisper turned into a chorus of voices, all calling her name, pleading with her to come closer. She stumbled back, terror clawing at her throat. The sun's rays barely penetrated the thick fog that seemed to emanate from the well itself, casting an otherworldly glow on the scene. Despite the daylight, the darkness within the well seemed to pulsate, beckoning. Lana knew she should run, leave this cursed place and never look back. But something in the voices made her hesitate, they sounded desperate, tormented, as if they were drowning and only she could save them. Gathering her courage, she edged closer to the well again. The voices grew louder, more insistent. She peered into the abyss, trying to discern any shapes in the darkness. Suddenly, a cold wind gusted from the well, carrying with it a foul stench of decay. Lana gagged, her eyes watering, but she couldn't tear herself away. As she watched, horrified, a pale hand emerged from the darkness, grasping the edge of the well. Another hand appeared, then another, all reaching towards her. Faces began to materialize in the dark, their features twisted in agony and despair. Lana screamed, stumbling backward, but her foot caught on a stone, and she fell to the ground. The hands reached out further, their fingers stretching impossibly towards her. She scrambled backward on her hands and feet, her back hitting the rough bark of a tree. The faces watched her, their mouths moving silently as if trying to communicate something urgent. Lana's mind raced. She remembered the photos on the fridge in the cottage, the blurred faces, the figure in her room. Were these the same souls, trapped here, bound to this unholy well? The thought chilled her to the bone. She had to escape, warn others, stop anyone else from suffering the same fate. But as she turned to run, she saw that the mist had closed in around her, the circle of cottages now hidden from view. She was trapped, the well and its ghastly inhabitants the only things clear in the suffocating fog. Desperation set in. Lana searched for any means of escape, her eyes darting around the clearing. That's when she spotted it, a small, overgrown path leading out of the circle. It was narrow and looked seldom used, but it was her only chance. With one last look at the well, Lana sprinted towards the path, the voices screaming after her, a cacophony of despair that echoed through the woods. She ran blindly, branches scratching her face, roots tripping her feet. The path seemed to twist and turn, leading her deeper into the forest, the sounds of the well's inhabitants still audible behind her. Panic fueled her legs, her lungs burning with the cold air. She didn't dare look back, fearing what might be following her. The path finally opened up onto a road, deserted and covered with fallen leaves. Lana paused, gasping for breath, her body aching from the exertion. She didn't recognize this road, but it had to lead somewhere, back to civilization, to safety. She chose a direction and started walking, her pace brisk despite her fatigue. The sun was higher now, but it did nothing to warm her or dispel the deep, lingering dread that clung to her. As she walked, Lana noticed something odd, no matter how long she walked, the scenery seemed to repeat itself. The same gnarled tree, the same bend in the road, over and over. A sinking realization dawned on her, she wasn't escaping. Somehow, she was looping back on herself, trapped in a cycle she couldn't understand. Exhaustion overtook her, and she collapsed on the side of the road, her mind whirling. Was this another part of the curse? Was she doomed to wander this lonely road forever? She closed her eyes, tears of frustration and fear slipping down her cheeks. When she opened her eyes, it was to the sound of a vehicle approaching. Relief flooded through her. 
Finally, someone could help her, get her out of this nightmare. She stood, waving her arms, but as the vehicle drew closer, her relief turned to horror. It was an old pickup truck, rusted and creaking, moving slowly down the road. But it was the driver that froze her blood, a figure shrouded in shadows, its face obscured, but its eyes glowing a faint, eerie red. As it passed her, it slowed, and the driver turned its head, fixing those red eyes on her. Lana felt a deep, soul-chilling dread, the air around her growing colder. The truck stopped a few meters ahead, the driver's side door creaking open. Lana couldn't move, her feet rooted to the spot as the figure stepped out, its movements slow and deliberate. It stood in the dim light, towering over her, a silhouette against the pallid sun. Lana wanted to scream, to run, but her body wouldn't obey. She was paralyzed by an overwhelming fear, the kind that seeps into your bones and settles there. The figure began to move towards her, each step deliberate, resonating with a dread that vibrated through the ground. Lana's heart pounded in her ears, her breath coming in sharp, ragged gasps. The figure stopped just a few feet away, its presence oppressive, suffocating. It reached out a hand, long fingers ending in blackened nails, as if charred by fire. Lana recoiled, finding her voice at last, a scream tearing from her throat, raw and desperate. But the scream seemed to dissolve into the mist, swallowed by the silent woods. The figure paused, tilting its head, as if curious about her reaction. Then, in a voice that was both gravelly and whisper-soft, it spoke, the words slithering into her ears like worms. You cannot escape, it hissed. Lana's mind raced, panic setting every nerve alight. She stumbled backward, her feet finally freeing themselves from the terror-induced paralysis. She turned and ran, not daring to look back, the figure's words echoing in her mind. The road twisted and turned, leading her through an ever-changing landscape of gnarled trees and thick underbrush. The air grew colder, the mist thicker, until she was running through a world gone gray and silent, void of life except for her frantic, pounding footsteps. Hours seemed to pass, or maybe minutes, it was impossible to tell in this place where time seemed twisted, distorted. Finally, Lana saw a light ahead, not the silver light of the sun, but a warm, golden glow that promised safety and warmth. As she approached, she realized it was a house, its windows aglow with light, smoke curling from the chimney. She slowed, approaching cautiously. The house looked inviting, a stark contrast to the desolation she had fled. But after everything, Lana's trust was shattered, every shadow was a hiding place, every sound a warning. She reached the front door, hesitating. Should she knock? What if this was another trap? The door creaked open on its own, as if answering her question. The warmth that spilled out was too tempting to resist. Lana stepped inside, the door closing silently behind her. The interior was cozy, a fire crackling in the hearth, the furniture old but well-kept. Hello, she called, her voice quivering. No answer. She moved further into the house, her footsteps muffled by thick, soft rugs. In the living room, she found a table set for two, candles lit in the middle casting gentle light around the room. It looked welcoming, but Lana felt a twinge of unease, everything was too perfect, too arranged. As she turned to explore further, she caught sight of a figure reflected in the mirror above the fireplace. Whipping around, she found herself face to face with a woman, older, her hair streaked with gray, her eyes a soft brown that somehow seemed familiar. Who are you? Lana asked, her voice barely a whisper. The woman smiled, a sad, knowing smile. I'm someone who once made the mistake of coming here, just like you. And now, I'm trapped, part of the house, part of the land. Lana felt a chill run down her spine. What do you mean, trapped? Why can't you leave? The woman's eyes filled with sorrow. Because once you've been chosen by the forest, by the darkness that binds this place, there's no leaving. You become part of it, 
part of its story. Lana backed away, her mind reeling. No, I'll find a way out. There has to be a way. The woman nodded slowly. Perhaps you will. But remember, the forest is old, its memory long and its reach far. You can run, hide, fight, but it will always find you. And when it does, it will never let you go. As Lana processed her words, the sound of a truck engine drifted through the air, faint but unmistakable. Her heart sank. The red-eyed driver? Was it returning? The woman seemed to sense her fear. You must rest now. You'll need your strength. She motioned to a door on the side. You can sleep in there. Just for tonight, you're safe. Lana knew she shouldn't, but exhaustion overruled her. She nodded, moving towards the room. As she passed the woman, a whisper, be careful who you trust. In the room, Lana lay down on the bed, her mind a whirlwind of fear, confusion, and exhaustion. As sleep claimed her, she wondered if she'd ever escape this nightmare or if the woman's words were a prophecy already set in motion. Her dreams, when they came, were a twisted maze of shadows and whispers, each turn revealing fragments of her day, distorted and menacing. She woke with a start, the room cloaked in darkness, the only light the faint glow of embers from the fireplace in the other room. Lana's heart pounded in her chest as she lay listening to the house settling around her. The quiet was oppressive, heavy with the weight of unspoken secrets. Rising from the bed, Lana moved silently to the window, peering out into the night. The forest was bathed in moonlight, trees casting long, gnarled shadows that twisted across the ground like writhing serpents. Something about the scene outside felt wrong, as if the very woods were watching her, breathing along with her. The sound of an engine pierced the silence, distant yet distinct. The same truck? Panic flared within her, and she stepped back from the window, her mind racing. She couldn't stay here, even if the woman had said it was safe for the night. Whatever was happening, Lana was sure it was closing in on her again. She grabbed her bag, slipping quietly out of the room and back into the living room. The house felt different in the dark, smaller, as if the walls were inching closer together. The table where the candles had burned brightly now held only melted stubs, the wax cold and hard. Lana paused at the front door, her hand on the doorknob, hesitating. Could she really venture back out there, into the woods that seemed to have claimed her as their own? With a deep, steadying breath, she opened the door and stepped out into the chill night air. The ground fog was thicker than before, swirling around her feet as she walked. The road, when she reached it, was just a darker patch in the mist, its borders blurred and indistinct. She followed it, each step taking her further from the supposed safety of the house, deeper into the unknown. As she walked, the silence was broken by rustlings in the underbrush, the snap of twigs, whispers carried on the wind that sounded almost like words. Lana's nerves were taut, her senses heightened to every small noise, every movement. She expected at any moment to see the truck looming out of the mist, or the shadowy figure stepping onto the road. Instead, she came upon another house, its architecture eerily similar to the first, windows dark, the building seeming to brood under the weight of years. The door stood slightly ajar, inviting or warning, Lana couldn't tell. Her curiosity, coupled with an urgent need for shelter, drew her forward. Inside, the air was musty, thick with the scent of mold and decay. Lana's flashlight beam flickered as she explored, revealing peeling wallpaper, dust-covered furniture, and portraits on the walls, their faces scratched out, eyes hollow. It felt as if each step deeper into the house took her further back in time, to a darker, forgotten era. In the kitchen, she found a newspaper dated years ago, the headline chilling, local disappearances continue, no leads. The story detailed several people who had vanished without a trace in the area, their last known whereabouts near where Lana now found herself. A cold shiver ran down her spine as she read, the implications clear and terrifying. 
Moving to leave, Lana heard a noise upstairs, a slow, deliberate thump, like a footstep. She froze, listening. The sound came again, closer this time. Someone, or something, was in the house with her. The realization hit her like a physical blow, fear rooting her to the spot. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the noise stopped. Silence descended, thick and suffocating. Lana waited, her breath shallow, her body tense for flight. But nothing happened. No footsteps approached, no doors creaked. Just when she thought she might have imagined it all, a voice whispered right behind her, looking for someone? Lana spun around, her flashlight beam slicing through the darkness. But there was no one there. Just the empty room and the echo of a question that seemed to hang in the air, malevolent and mocking. Heart hammering, Lana fled the house, her fear a palpable force that drove her back onto the road, back into the embrace of the mist-shrouded woods. The road twisted and turned, never seeming to end, always looping back on itself in a labyrinth and maze. As dawn broke, pale and unsteady, Lana found herself standing before a bridge, old and covered in vines, its wood rotted and dangerous looking. The river it spanned was black and still, reflecting nothing, not even the weak morning light. Crossing it might lead to safety, or to further darkness. But behind her, the woods whispered and the road curled back on itself, offering no escape but the endless loop of fear and shadows. With a deep, steadying breath, Lana stepped onto the bridge, the wood creaking ominously under her feet, echoing the pounding of her heart. Each step was a test of will, the planks groaning, threatening to give way beneath her. The mist clung to her, damp and cold, as if the very air sought to pull her down into the dark waters below. Halfway across, Lana paused, the bridge swaying slightly with a breeze that carried the faintest whispers of the voices she had fled from. Suddenly, the bridge lurched violently, a board snapping under her weight. Lana screamed, clutching at the vine-covered railings as she struggled to maintain her balance. The whispers grew louder, turning into mocking laughter that swirled around her in the mist. Heart racing, Lana pressed forward, the bridge seeming to stretch on impossibly long, the far side always just out of reach. Another plank cracked, and she stumbled, nearly falling through the gap. She caught herself just in time, her hands scraped and bleeding as she pulled herself back up. The voices crescendoed, a cacophony of terror that filled her ears, drowned out her thoughts. They called her name, beckoned her to give in, to join them in the dark waters below where all would be silent, all would be still. But Lana pushed on, driven by a desperate hope that the end of the bridge, the end of her nightmare, lay just a few steps away. Finally, with a last, desperate lunge, Lana reached the other side, collapsing onto solid ground as the bridge fell away behind her, crashing into the river with a sound like thunder. She lay there, panting, her body aching, every breath of victory over the darkness that had sought to claim her. As she lay on the riverbank, the sun finally broke through the mist, weak rays of light scattering the shadows. Lana rose slowly, her limbs heavy, her mind weary. She looked back at the river, now calm, the remnants of the bridge floating downstream. There was no going back. Ahead, the forest opened up, leading to a path she hadn't seen before. It wound away from the river, away from the nightmarish loop of the road and the haunted houses. Lana followed it, her steps uncertain but determined. The path led uphill through trees that gradually thinned, revealing glimpses of a town in the distance, its buildings bathed in the morning light. But as she walked, Lana could not shake the feeling that something had followed her from the woods, a presence lingering just at the edge of her senses. She turned, looking back down the path, and there it was, a figure, distant but unmistakable, standing at the edge of the trees, watching her. Its eyes, red as coals, burned into hers, a silent promise that it was not the end. Lana turned away, her heart heavy. She knew then that her escape was only temporary, that the darkness would always be a step behind, waiting for a moment of weakness, a moment of doubt. But for now, she had the sun on her face, 
the town ahead and a chance to fight another day. And with every step towards the light, she carried the dark with her, a reminder of what lay waiting should she ever stumble, should she ever look back. Thus, the horror followed Lana, a shadow cast by her own survival, a tale not concluded but merely paused, waiting for the next night, the next fear, the next chapter in a story that might never truly end. In a world that had grown accustomed to the convenience of online bookings and temporary home stays, the sinister truths of the SCP Foundation's latest venture, SCP Airbnb, remained carefully veiled behind a facade of normalcy and appealing vacation rentals. The initiative was launched as a subdivision under the Foundation's umbrella, purportedly to fund their clandestine operations. Each property listed under SCP Airbnb was not merely a rental but a containment site for anomalies the Foundation could neither lock away nor destroy. The unwitting guests played a critical role in these containment protocols, their interactions with the properties providing vital data on anomaly behavior and containment efficacy. Every guest review, every complaint, and every unexplained experience fed into the Foundation's vast database, analyzed by researchers for patterns and potential breaches. James and Lila Sullivan, a couple from Ohio, booked a charming little cabin in the woods of Maine for their 10th anniversary. The SCP Airbnb listing showed a picturesque cabin surrounded by acres of untouched forest, promising complete privacy and escape from the hustle of urban life. Upon arrival, the couple was enchanted by the rustic beauty of the cabin. It was as though the cabin itself was part of the living forest, with vines creeping up its sides and wildflowers dotting the entry path. The host, who introduced himself only as Mr. Red, was an affable man with an unsettling habit of avoiding direct eye contact. He gave them a brief tour, emphasized the need to follow the house rules precisely, and left hurriedly. As night fell on their first day, the quaint charm of the cabin took on a more ominous tone. The forest seemed unnaturally silent, devoid of the usual nighttime chatter. Inside, the cabin's wood walls creaked continuously, as if they were settling or communicating. Curious and restless, James explored the cabin while Lila read by the fire. In the basement, he found a locked door with no keyhole. It was marked simply with a bronze plaque that read SCP-1983. Unable to satisfy his curiosity, he rejoined Lila upstairs, the image of the door lingering in his mind. That night, as they slept, the silence of the forest was broken by a faint humming sound that seemed to emanate from the walls of the cabin. Lila woke first, the sound drawing her out of bed and towards the basement. James, waking to find the bed beside him cold and empty, followed her trail to the basement door, which now stood inexplicably open. Peering inside, he saw Lila standing in the middle of a room filled with strange, pulsating lights that cast eerie shadows on the walls. The room was not a room at all but an entrance to something otherworldly, an archive of other dimensions, each contained within its own bizarre ecosystem. James tried to call out to Lila, but the humming grew louder, drowning out his voice. As he stepped forward, the door slammed shut behind him, trapping him inside the basement that was no longer just a basement. He watched, horrified, as tendrils of light reached out to Lila, wrapping around her as she stood transfixed. The couple found themselves separated by a mere few feet, yet impossibly far apart, each stranded on their own fragment of reality. As they reached out to each other, the space between them filled with whispers, voices of past guests, perhaps, or other victims of the SCP. Meanwhile, outside the bounds of the cabin and its immediate horrors, Mr. Red reported back to the Foundation. Containment effective, his voice crackled over the radio. The anomaly reacts well to new subjects. Recommend continuation of current protocol. Back inside the alternate space, James and Lila slowly realized the role they were forced to play. Their love, their fear, and their very presence fed the anomaly, keeping it stable, keeping it contained. As they struggled to understand their new reality, they began to notice patterns in the light, in the sounds, and in the whispers. 
their ordeal was far from over, it had just begun. The true nature of SCP Airbnb's operation loomed over them, a revelation that promised no easy escape. Each decision they made now echoed in the dimensions around them, each echo a potential key to their salvation, or a deeper plunge into their nightmare. As the whispers grew into coherent voices, James and Lila prepared for what was to come, unaware of how deep the rabbit hole went or how closely they were being observed by those who had engineered their fate. Their struggle against the unseen and unknown forces of SCP Airbnb would lead them on a journey through layers of reality that few had survived to tell about. The story of their fight against the most evil company on Earth was just beginning. As James and Lila faced the inescapable reality that they were not merely guests but subjects in an elaborate experiment, their surroundings seemed to pulse with a malevolent life of their own. The walls of the cabin, once charmingly rustic, now appeared to be watching them, the knots in the wood-like eyes that followed their every move. The alternate space that they found themselves trapped in seemed to distort time itself. Minutes stretched into hours, and hours could pass in the blink of an eye. The ambient light from the tendrils created shadows that danced along the walls, forming shapes and figures that moved with an unnerving autonomy. James, ever the skeptic, tried to rationalize their experiences as a dream or hallucination brought on by stress or perhaps a gas leak. But Lila, who had always been more in tune with the unexplainable, felt a deep, visceral fear that this was all too real, too intentional. Their first semblance of understanding came when they discovered that touching the tendrils did not harm them but instead caused fluctuations in the light patterns. These fluctuations seemed to follow a pattern, almost like a language. If they could decode this language, perhaps they could communicate with the anomaly or whatever consciousness might be controlling it. Lila began to experiment, touching different tendrils at different intervals, noting the changes in the visual and auditory environment. As she worked, James explored the boundaries of their prison, finding that while the physical space was confined to the cabin's dimensions, the perceptual space was boundless. He stumbled upon artifacts left behind by previous occupants, scraps of paper with scribbled notes, a child's broken toy, a woman's scarf, all absorbed into the cabin's fabric. Each item pulsed with the same eerie light as the tendrils, suggesting they had been part of previous experiments or containment attempts. Meanwhile, the voices grew louder and more distinct. They seemed to be echoes of previous victims or perhaps remnants of their consciousness, trapped within the anomaly. They pleaded for help, warned of dangers, and sometimes whispered dark secrets and forebodings. James and Lila were not alone in their fight to understand and perhaps escape. They learned from the voices that the anomaly was known as SCP-1983-A, a sentient dimension that fed on emotional and psychological energy. The SCP Foundation had long struggled to contain it, resorting to using unsuspecting guests as a means to stabilize the dimension through their emotional responses. Armed with this new knowledge, the couple started to manipulate their emotions to affect the anomaly's behavior. Fear, love, desperation, each emotion seemed to tune the frequency of the dimension slightly differently. Their plan was to create a harmonic resonance that might disrupt the anomaly enough to force it open, to tear through the fabric of SCP-1983-A and allow them a way out. As days or perhaps weeks passed, they honed their emotional manipulation, becoming more adept at controlling their responses to the anomaly's stimuli. But as they did, the anomaly adapted, presenting more intense and disturbing scenarios to provoke them. Images of their past, twisted versions of their memories played out in the shadows. Their greatest regrets, their deepest fears were laid bare, not just to each other but to the unseen observers who monitored their every reaction. Their personal hell deepened when they realized that their efforts to control the anomaly were actually feeding it, making it stronger. The more they tried to use their emotions to manipulate the environment, the more the anomaly learned, and the more it used their own tactics against them. One evening, as they sat exhausted and despairing, a new figure appeared. It was not a shadow or a voice but a person, real and solid. He introduced himself as Dr. Weiss, a researcher with the SCP Foundation who had been monitoring their progress. 
He was part of a faction within the Foundation that believed the use of human subjects in this way was unethical, and he had come to help them escape. Dr. Weiss explained that the cabin was equipped with an emergency override that could temporarily disrupt the anomaly, but it was hidden within the very heart of SCP-1983 as power source. To reach it, they would need to dive deeper into the dimension, to face the core where raw emotional energy was converted into the anomaly's sustenance. Gathering their courage, James and Lila prepared to delve into the depths of the dimension, guided by Dr. Weiss. As they approached the core, the environment became increasingly chaotic, the air thick with a palpable dread. The voices screamed in torment, the shadows twisted in agony, and the fabric of reality itself seemed to tear at the seams. The path to the core was fraught with perils, each step forward a battle against both the physical manifestations of the anomaly and their own internal demons. But as they moved closer, they realized that each challenge they faced seemed to weaken the anomaly slightly, the light dimming, the voices faltering. At the threshold of the core, they paused, knowing that what lay beyond could be their salvation or their doom. With Dr. Weiss at their side, James and Lila steeled themselves for what was to come. The core of SCP-1983-A was a maelstrom of swirling energy, a vortex of emotions so powerful that it seemed to draw the very essence from their souls. The closer they got, the more overwhelming the sensations became, despair, elation, terror, and love blended into a cacophony that threatened to consume their identities. The air around them vibrated with the force of the unleashed emotions, and the ground beneath their feet pulsed as if alive. Dr. Weiss explained that this was the heart of the anomaly, where all the collected emotional energies were processed and fed back into the dimension to maintain its existence. As they approached the very center, they could see a structure resembling an altar, made of a material that seemed to shift between solid and ethereal states. Dr. Weiss pointed to the altar, explaining that it was the focal point of the anomaly's power, the place where the emergency override could be activated. However, reaching it was perilous, the energy around the altar was so intense that it could drive a person to madness. Armed with this knowledge, James and Lila linked hands, drawing strength from each other's presence. They focused on their deepest bond, their shared history and love, using it as a shield against the barrage of psychic and emotional energy assaulting them. Each step forward was a battle, their minds assailed by visions of their worst fears and greatest joys, each memory twisted into grotesque parodies designed to break their spirit. The voices around them grew louder, no longer just whispers but clear, shouting, pleading, warning. They urged James and Lila to turn back, to give up, to surrender to the anomaly. But with Dr. Weiss's guidance, they pushed forward, their resolve hardening with each resisted call. Finally, they reached the altar. It was surrounded by a halo of blinding light, and the air thrummed with power. Dr. Weiss instructed them to place their hands on the altar and focus on a single, clear emotion. The purity of that emotion, he explained, would act as a key, unlocking the override mechanism. James chose hope, while Lila focused on love. Together, they pressed their hands against the shifting surface of the altar. The response was immediate and violent. The energy surged up through their bodies, searing pain mingling with a euphoric clarity. Around them, the dimension began to quake, the very fabric of the anomaly buckling under the strain of their focused emotional energy. The core's light intensified, blinding them, and the voices crescendoed into a deafening roar. Then, Suddenly, there was silence. The light snapped out as if extinguished by an unseen hand, plunging them into darkness. In the pitch black, they felt rather than saw Dr. Weiss moving. His voice came through the darkness, calm yet urgent. It's done. The override has initiated. We must go now, before the dimension collapses entirely. With the anomaly destabilized, the environment around them began to deteriorate rapidly. The ground shook, and the air was filled with the sound of tearing, like fabric being ripped apart. They ran, guided by Dr. Weiss's flashlight, dodging falling debris and evading the deep fissures that opened in the ground. 
As they made their way back through the now collapsing dimension, they realized that the emotional onslaught had ceased. Instead, there was a palpable sense of release, as if the anomaly itself was sighing in relief. They reached the basement door just as the cabin above seemed to groan and settle, the sound ominous in the stillness that followed the chaos. Dr. Weiss held the door open for them, urging them through. Quickly, out of here. The whole structure might collapse. They emerged from the basement into the cabin, which, strangely, appeared undisturbed by the tumult they had experienced below. The wood creaked softly, familiarly, no longer with the sinister overtone it had carried before. Outside, the dawn was breaking, the first light filtering through the trees in soft, golden beams. The forest seemed to have awakened from a long slumber, the air fresh and clear. As they stood there, taking in the peace that had replaced the night's horrors, they realized that their ordeal might have ended. But the world of SCP Foundation and its anomalies was vast and filled with unknowns. As they contemplated their escape from one nightmare, the potential for countless others loomed large. Somewhere out there, another SCP, another experiment, awaited them. And so, their watch continued, vigilant and unending, as the dawn heralded not just a new day, but new challenges. James and Lila, standing at the edge of the forest as the dawn stretched its golden fingers through the dense trees, felt a momentary peace wash over them. But the serenity was fleeting. Though they had escaped the immediate clutches of SCP-1983-A, the broader implications of what they had experienced gnawed at their resolve. The SCP Foundation's web was vast and intricate, and they had only just brushed against its outermost threads. Dr. Weiss, looking equally relieved and burdened, checked his watch, a device that seemed too ordinary for someone who had navigated the complexities of an alternate dimension. We don't have much time, he cautioned, his voice a low rumble against the morning chorus of the woods. The Foundation will notice the disruption. They monitor all anomalies closely, and what we've done, it won't go unnoticed for long. Lila, her mind racing with fatigue and fear, nodded. What's the next step then? How do we get away from here? The Foundation, they'll want to contain us, James interjected, his tone bitter. To them, we're loose ends now. Witnesses to things that defy explanation and threaten their control. Dr. Weiss pulled out a small, rugged device from his backpack. I've prepared for this. This is a short-range teleporter, experimental, but should be enough to get us out of immediate danger. He handed the device to James. We can't use it here, though. Too close to the anomaly site. We need to get a few miles away, out of their primary surveillance zone. They moved quickly, leaving the cabin and its nightmarish basement behind. The forest seemed to watch them depart, the trees whispering secrets to the morning wind. Every rustle of the leaves felt like eyes tracking their progress, every snapped twig a signal to unseen observers. After a tense hour of navigating through the woods, Dr. Weiss signaled them to stop. They were far enough now, he assured them, from the Foundation's immediate reach. James activated the teleporter, the device emitting a low hum as it powered up. A bright light enveloped them, and for a moment, they felt as if they were being stretched through reality itself. They reappeared on the outskirts of a small town, the teleportation disorienting but successful. The town was quaint, a postcard image of rural America with its sleepy main street and colorful storefronts. Yet, the normalcy of the scene felt jarring to James and Lila, who had seen the fabric of their reality torn apart. We need to split up, Dr. Weiss advised once they had regained their bearings. I'll draw them off. I know how they operate, what they'll expect. You two need to go underground, stay off the grid. I can help arrange that. But how will we know you're okay? Lila asked, the concern evident in her voice. You won't. Dr. Weiss said flatly. That's part of this life. But I'll be fine. I've been dodging the Foundation for years. 
They parted ways then, the couple heading into the depths of the town while Dr. Weiss disappeared into the morning mist. James and Lila found themselves standing outside a small cafe, the smell of coffee and baked goods wafting out to them. It was so normal, so painfully mundane, that for a moment, Lila wondered if they could ever return to a normal life. As they sat down at a corner table, their minds were a whirlwind of fear and planning. They needed new identities, resources, a place to hide where the SCP Foundation couldn't reach them. Each step would be fraught with peril. But their escape and survival were only part of the equation. The couple knew too much now, had seen too much. The reality of SCP Airbnb and the Foundation's manipulation of anomalies for their own obscure purposes was a truth that, once known, couldn't be unknown. They couldn't just disappear, they had to act. While they discussed their next moves, the whispers of the forest and the echoes of the voices they had heard lingered in their minds. They were survivors of a dark ordeal, but the fight against the SCP Foundation was just beginning. The organization's reach was long, its resources vast, and its secrets dark. James and Lila would need all their wits and courage to navigate the shadowy world they had stumbled into. Their journey had taken them from ordinary citizens to key players in a clandestine war against an organization that defied the known boundaries of science and morality. As they planned their next steps, the weight of their new reality settled around them like a cloak. The path ahead was fraught with dangers, but also with the possibility of exposing the deepest secrets of the SCP Foundation to the world and so, fortified by their resolve and haunted by their experiences, they prepared to dive deeper into the shadows, where the true battle awaited. As James and Lila huddled in the corner of the cafe, their whispered plans mingled with the soft clinking of coffee cups and the murmur of other patrons. Their sense of normalcy was superficial, beneath it, their minds raced with strategies and fears. They knew they couldn't stay in the town for long, the SCP Foundation's resources and reach could easily unearth them from such a quaint hiding spot. They decided to head to a large city where blending in would be easier and access to resources more abundant. Before they could finalize their plans, Lila's phone, which she had forgotten to dispose of, began to vibrate. The screen displayed an unknown number. Cautiously, Lila answered, her voice barely above a whisper. The message was cryptic, a single sentence that sent chills down their spines, we see you. Realizing the potential danger, they left the cafe immediately, their coffee untouched, their pastries uneaten. They discarded Lila's phone in a nearby trash bin, crushing it underfoot before covering it with waste. The streets of the small town suddenly felt oppressive, each passerby a potential observer, every car that slowed nearby a potential threat. Their hurried steps took them to the town's outskirts where they stole glances back at the tranquil scenes of everyday life, continuing unaware of the couple's silent terror. They reached the town's small bus station and boarded a bus heading to New York City, blending in with the crowd of mid-morning travelers. As the bus departed, winding its way out of the town, James and Lila felt the weight of eyes upon them. Paranoia gnawed at their resolve, each stop a test of their nerves, each new passenger a potential agent of the Foundation. They spoke little during the journey, conserving their energy, trying to piece together a semblance of a plan from the chaos that had become their life. Upon arriving in New York, the city's vastness offered them a cloak of anonymity. The towering buildings and teeming streets provided a stark contrast to the quiet terror of the cabin in the woods. They found a cheap motel on the outskirts of the city, paying cash and using fake names. The room was small, the sounds of the city a constant background noise, but it offered a temporary sanctuary. Here, they plotted their next moves. They needed allies, information, and a way to fight back. Their experience at the cabin had exposed them to just one of many horrors hidden by the SCP Foundation, and they felt a duty to expose the truth. Their plans were interrupted by a knock at the door late at night. Heart pounding, James peeked through the peephole. Standing in the dimly lit hallway was Dr. Weiss, his appearance disheveled, a stark contrast to the composed figure they had last seen. Quickly, they let him in. 
Dr. Weiss looked around the room with a wary eye before speaking, his voice a hoarse whisper. They're mobilizing resources like you wouldn't believe. You both need to be extremely careful. I've brought something that might help, he said, handing them a flash drive. This contains information on several SCPs, some even more dangerous than the one you encountered. It's your leverage, your proof. Before they could respond, a loud crash echoed from the motel's front entrance. Dr. Weiss rushed to the window, his eyes scanning the night. They've found us, he hissed. You need to leave, now. James and Lila grabbed the flash drive and their sparse belongings, following Dr. Weiss out the back door of the motel. They slipped into the night, the city's shadows swallowing them as they ran. The hunt was relentless. The Foundation's agents were shadows within shadows, their presence an oppressive blanket over the couple's every move. New York's labyrinthine streets were both a curse and a blessing, offering hideouts and hazards in equal measure. As they moved through the darkened city, the couple knew their journey was far from over. With the flash drive's data as their guide, they had a clear purpose, but the path was fraught with dangers, each step forward a potential misstep into further nightmares. The city's skyline loomed over them, a jagged silhouette against the night sky. They were alone, yet entirely exposed in the vast urban wilderness, a paradox that defined their new existence. They were players in a game much larger and more sinister than they had ever imagined, and the real horror was just beginning. Nathan and Ella, an adventurous young couple, decided to celebrate their anniversary in a quaint and secluded Airbnb cottage nestled in the Colorado Rockies. The host, an affable man named Tom, had glowing reviews and the pictures promised a picturesque retreat away from the hustle and bustle of Denver. Upon arrival, the couple was awestruck by the beauty of the landscape, a pristine view of snow-capped mountains, vast forests, and a crystal-clear lake nearby. The cottage itself was charming and rustic, with one peculiar trait, an unusually large collection of antique mirrors adorning every room. Tom greeted them warmly, his demeanor as inviting as the cozy interior. After a brief tour, he handed them the keys with a peculiar warning, enjoy your stay in just one small thing, try not to cover or move the mirrors, they're quite old and part of the house's charm. The first night was as magical as Nathan and Ella had hoped. They cooked dinner together, enjoyed wine by the fireplace, and eventually retreated to the master bedroom upstairs. However, the enchantment of the evening soon gave way to an unsettling feeling in the dead of night. Ella woke up to a faint whispering sound. It was difficult to pinpoint its origin as it seemed to bounce off the walls. Nathan, a heavy sleeper, was undisturbed, his breaths deep and even. Ella rose from the bed, the whisper growing clearer as she approached the hallway. The sound led her to the largest mirror in the hallway, an ornate frame with intricate carvings that seemed to writhe in the dim moonlight. Peering into the glass, Ella's reflection seemed normal at first, but as she stared, her image began to warp subtly. Her reflection's eyes blinked back at her out of sync, sending a shiver down her spine. Startled, she backed away and the image returned to normal. She decided it must be a trick of the light or her imagination. The next morning, Nathan found Ella quiet and distracted during breakfast. When he questioned her, she dismissed her experience as a result of the wine and fatigue. But as they planned their day, Nathan noticed that the mirrors seemed to subtly demand his attention. Whenever he passed by one, he could almost swear he saw something, or someone, moving just at the edge of his vision. Despite the eerie occurrences, they spent the day hiking and exploring the nearby town. Returning to the cottage as the sun set, they found the atmosphere had shifted, the once comforting isolation felt heavy, oppressive. As darkness fell, both felt an unspoken anxiety about spending another night there. Determined to keep a light mood, they played board games by the fireplace. Yet, as the night grew deeper, the air around them felt denser, chillier, even as the fire roared. The whispers returned, this time louder, and Nathan heard them too. 
The voices seemed to echo from the mirrors, each syllable clear, yet in a language neither could understand. Increasingly unnerved, they decided to remove the mirror in the living room, covering it with a blanket. Almost instantly, a palpable anger seemed to radiate through the room. The temperature dropped sharply, and the fire sputtered as if choked by an unseen force. Nathan and Ella recoiled as a loud crack split the air, the mirror they had covered shattered behind the blanket. Frightened but resolute, they planned to leave at first light, unwilling to endure another night. They retreated to the bedroom, locking the door behind them, a meager barrier between them and the unknown. Sleep was elusive as they lay listening to the sounds of the house, the wind against the windows, the creaking of old wood, and a soft, malicious chuckling that seemed to seep through the walls. In the pitch darkness, they huddled together, whispering reassurances. Suddenly, the door handle rattled violently, as if someone, or something, was trying to get in. With a loud thud, something heavy struck the door, causing both to scream. The assault stopped as abruptly as it had begun, leaving only the echo of their fright. As dawn approached, the couple felt a tentative relief, believing they had endured the worst. But as the light crept into the room, they realized the door was ajar, despite being locked and barricaded. Peering out, they saw every mirror in the house was now cracked, their frames splintered. The whispering had ceased, replaced by a silence that was somehow more terrifying. Eager to leave, they packed quickly. As they descended the stairs, the front door swung open on its own, inviting them to leave. They needed no further prompting, rushing to their car, the unsettling feeling of being watched lingering with them. As they drove away, Nathan glanced in the rearview mirror, expecting to see the cottage recede into the distance. Instead, he saw a figure standing in the upstairs window, watching them leave, a figure that was distinctly not their genial host Tom, but a shadowed, indistinct form that seemed to ripple and sway as if made of smoke. Nathan's breath hitched, his hands tightening on the steering wheel. Beside him, Ella had turned to look back too, her face pale as she caught sight of the figure. Just drive, she whispered, her voice trembling. Nathan nodded, pressing harder on the accelerator as they left the cottage far behind. The road ahead was foggy, the trees lining the path seemed to close in around them, the branches forming a tunnel that obscured the sky. The drive back to Denver should have taken a couple of hours, but time seemed to stretch and distort. The same turns appeared over and over again, like a loop they couldn't escape. Nathan's eyes darted to the GPS, but it flickered and went blank. A deep sense of dread settled over them, the car's headlights barely piercing the thick fog that rolled in like a living thing. Ella turned on the radio, seeking any distraction, but the only sound was a static hum that gradually morphed into faint whispering, mirroring the eerie sounds from the cottage. She quickly turned it off, her eyes wide with fear. What's happening, Nathan? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I don't know. But we'll get through this, Nathan replied, trying to sound more confident than he felt. The landscape slowly changed, the familiar road replaced by an unkempt, gravel path that crunched under the tires. They hadn't turned off the main road, yet nothing looked familiar. The car's headlights flickered, and for a moment, darkness enveloped them. When the lights blinked back on, a figure stood in the middle of the road, causing Nathan to slam on the brakes. The figure was cloaked, its face hidden under a hood, its hands raised as if beckoning them forward. Ella screamed, grabbing Nathan's arm. Don't stop, Nathan. Please, just keep going. Nathan swerved around the figure, glancing in the rearview mirror as he did. The figure remained in the road, watching them as they drove away, its posture eerily calm. As they continued, the temperature dropped, their breaths visible in the air. The heater in the car was on full blast but did nothing to ward off the bone-chilling cold that seemed to seep into their very souls. After what felt like hours, they saw lights ahead, a small town, its dimly lit streets deserted. Nathan didn't remember any town being on the route back to Denver, but neither of them cared. 
They needed to stop, to get away from the oppressive feeling of the car. They pulled into the town, the streets eerily silent. The buildings looked old, worn by time and weather, their windows dark. They parked outside what looked like a diner, the only building with any light visible. The sign was flickering, half the letters burned out, but it offered a beacon of hope. We need to find out where we are, Nathan said, his voice steady despite the pounding of his heart. They got out of the car, the door closing with a loud thud that echoed down the empty street. As they approached the diner, they noticed that the light was coming from a single bulb swinging gently above the door. Inside, the diner was empty, the tables unoccupied, the counter dusty. A radio behind the counter played softly, the same static-filled whispering they'd heard in the car. Nathan called out, but no one answered. The place seemed abandoned, yet the coffee pot on the counter was warm, a fresh pot brewed. Ella shivered, hugging herself. This doesn't feel right, Nathan. It feels like we're being watched. Nathan felt it too, the weight of unseen eyes upon them. He glanced around, half expecting to see the cloaked figure from the road or the shadowed form from the cottage window. But there was only the empty diner, the swinging light bulb casting more shadows than light. As they turned to leave, the door to the kitchen swung open slowly, the creak of its hinges loud in the silent diner. From the shadows behind the door, a low, guttural voice spoke, sending a shiver down their spines. Lost are you? The voice asked, its tone mocking. A figure stepped from the shadows, its features obscured, but its eyes, a piercing, unnatural blue, fixed on them with an intensity that rooted them to the spot. The figure moved closer, its movements smooth and deliberate. Many are lost here, never to find their way back. What makes you think you'll be any different? Nathan and Ella were too frightened to speak, their instincts screaming at them to run, but their bodies unwilling to cooperate. The figure chuckled, a sound as cold as the air around them. You came to the mountains seeking escape, a little adventure. But some places, the figure continued, are not meant to be disturbed. They hold secrets that are better left alone. The figure's gaze seemed to pierce through them, reading their deepest fears. Nathan found his voice, though it trembled. What do you want from us? The figure's lips curled into a smirk, its eyes never leaving theirs. To show you what lies beyond the veil. You've glimpsed it already, with the mirrors, the figure on the road, the endless loop. Reality here bends, twists, and what you see is just the surface. Ella clutched Nathan's hand tightly, her other hand reaching out to steady herself against a diner chair. How do we leave this place? She asked, her voice a whisper. The figure stepped closer, its face still obscured by shadows. Why leave so soon? You haven't seen all there is to see. The night is long, and the darkness has much to reveal. Outside, the wind began to howl, a sound that seemed almost human in its wail. The diner's lights flickered more aggressively, casting the room into brief moments of darkness. When the lights flickered back on, the figure was gone, the door to the kitchen swinging slightly as if in the wake of its departure. Nathan and Ella stood frozen for a moment, unsure if the danger had passed or if it had just begun. The eerie feeling of being watched persisted, heavier now, as if the walls themselves held breaths. We need to get out of here, Nathan said, pulling Ella toward the diner's exit. They stepped back into the cold, the town silent around them, the darkness seeming to press in from all sides. They hurried back to their car, the sense of urgency driving them forward. As they approached, the car seemed untouched, but the atmosphere around it had changed, the air felt charged, electric. Nathan fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking. The car door opened with a creak, and they climbed inside, locking the doors the moment they were in. He turned the key in the ignition, the engine sputtering to life on the first try. Relief washed over them briefly until they realized the road they had come in on was no longer visible. 
In its place was just more of the thick, oppressive fog that seemed to have a life of its own. The GPS flickered back to life, its screen glitching before stabilizing. A new route appeared on the display, one that hadn't been there before. It was a road leading out of the town, a straight shot that promised to reconnect with the main highway. With no other options, Nathan put the car into gear and drove into the fog. The headlights carved a path through the mist, but the road ahead remained shrouded in uncertainty. Ella kept her eyes on the GPS, the line marking their route the only sure thing in a world that no longer made sense. The further they drove, the more the scenery began to change. The trees grew denser, taller, their branches gnarled and twisting towards the sky like desperate hands. Shadows moved just beyond the reach of the headlights, quick and darting as if the forest itself was alive. Whispers filled the car, a cacophony of voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. Nathan tried to focus on the road, but the voices grew louder, drowning out even the sound of the engine. Then, up ahead, the lights caught something in the road. A figure, standing just as before, cloaked and hooded, its face obscured. Nathan slowed the car, stopping just feet away from it. The figure raised its head, and though its face was hidden, they could feel its gaze on them, cold and calculating. You cannot outrun your fate, it said, its voice echoing in the car, filling the space with dread. The figure stepped aside, gesturing down the road. Go then, see for yourself what lies at the end of this path. With no other path available, Nathan drove past the figure, the road stretching out endlessly before them. The trees seemed to close in, the whispers grew to shouts, and the fog enveloped the car completely, obscuring all but a few feet of the road ahead. As they drove, the air inside the car grew colder, the shadows darker, and the line between reality and nightmare blurred until it was impossible to tell one from the other. And ahead, in the distance, the faintest glimmer of light beckoned them forward, a beacon in the darkness that promised answers or perhaps, the culmination of their terror. The road seemed to stretch on interminably, the faint light ahead growing neither closer nor further away, as if suspended in the fog. The car's interior was silent save for the sound of their heavy breathing and the incessant whispers that now seemed to seep from the very fabric of the car seats. Ella clutched Nathan's arm, her eyes wide as she stared into the opaque whiteness outside. Each breath they exhaled fogged the windows, adding to the claustrophobia of the enclosed space. As they continued, the whispers morphed into discernible voices, voices that spoke their names, voices that recounted memories only Nathan and Ella knew. They spoke of hidden fears, whispered secrets, and unspoken regrets, weaving an audio tape of personal and invasive thoughts that left the couple feeling exposed and vulnerable. The trees that lined the road were now grotesquely distorted, their branches twisted into gnarled shapes that resembled hands clawing at the fog. Every so often, a face would appear pressed against the window, gone as quickly as it came, weaving only the fleeting touch of fingertips trailing down the glass. Nathan tried to focus on the driving, but the road itself seemed to be playing tricks on him. It would suddenly dip or curve without warning, the GPS signal lost completely now, leaving them navigating by instinct alone. The light that had seemed a beacon now flickered like a candle flame in the wind, taunting them with its elusive promise of escape. Ella turned on the radio again, desperate for any sound other than the haunting voices, but what came through was not music or static, but a low, droning chant that resonated with a sinister cadence. The words were unrecognizable, a language foreign and ancient, yet they seemed to pulse with an urgent malevolence that set their nerves on edge. Turn it off! Nathan shouted, his voice breaking as the chant seemed to grow louder, vibrating through the car's frame. Ella complied, her fingers trembling as she pressed the button, plunging the car back into oppressive silence. Just as she did, the car lurched as if struck, causing Nathan to lose control momentarily. He managed to steady it, but not before their hearts leapt into their throats. Outside, the fog began to swirl violently, as if a storm were brewing within it. Shapes moved within the mist, large, looming figures that paced alongside the car, keeping speed with them. 
Ella screamed as a face, horribly disfigured and screaming in silence, appeared next to her window, its mouth agape in a silent wail. Nathan swerved instinctively, nearly veering off the road. He regained control, his breath shallow and ragged. We have to keep going, he gasped, gripping the steering wheel until his knuckles turned white. We can't stop here, not now. Ella nodded, her face pale, her eyes darting frantically from window to window, watching the horrors that paraded just beyond the glass. The road seemed to narrow, forcing Nathan to slow down as the branches scratched against the car like fingers trying to claw their way in. The light ahead was now brighter, more focused, as if it were calling them toward it. As they drew closer, the fog began to thin, revealing a large, imposing gate that loomed ahead. It was wrought iron, twisted and adorned with ornate spikes that gleamed under the light, which they now saw emanated from a large, old-fashioned lantern hanging above the gate. The figures in the fog backed away as they approached the gate, their forms dissipating into the mist as if unwilling or unable to follow them further. Nathan stopped the car in front of the gate, the engine idling roughly. The lantern cast eerie shadows on the ground, and the gate itself was chained shut, a large padlock securing it. Ella reached out to touch Nathan's hand, her voice a whisper. What do we do now? Nathan looked at the padlock, then at the lantern, and back at the road they had traveled. We find a way through, he said, his voice determined. Or we find another way around. But we can't go back. We can't ever go back. The decision made, they stepped out of the car, the ground beneath their feet crunching with frost. The air was colder here, the silence deeper. They approached the gate, their movements hesitant but resolute. As they reached out to examine the lock, the lantern above flickered violently, casting dancing shadows across the iron. And from the shadows, a new voice emerged, deeper and more terrifying than the rest, booming through the stillness. Why do you seek passage? It bellowed, the gate itself seeming to vibrate with the power of the words. Nathan and Ella stepped back, their eyes wide. The voice continued, its tone mocking yet curious. What lies beyond is not for the faint of heart. Do you dare to uncover what many have sought to keep hidden? Or will you flee, like all the others, back to your mundane realities, forever wondering what might have been? The air around them grew colder, and the mist began to seep back towards them, slithering along the ground like a living thing. Nathan clenched his fists, his resolve hardening. We've come too far to turn back now, he shouted into the darkness, his voice bold despite the fear that gripped him. Ella nodded in agreement, her own voice steady as she added, we want to go through. We need to see what's beyond. Tell us what we need to do. The booming voice laughed, a sound that seemed to shake the very earth beneath their feet. Very well, it said. But know this, the path forward is irreversible, and what you find may not grant you the peace you seek. To open the gate, one of you must remain behind, a guardian of the threshold, forever bound to the mist. Nathan and Ella exchanged a horrified glance. The choice was cruel, unthinkable. Yet, as they considered their journey, the hauntings they'd endured, and the uncanny lure of the unknown that had driven them this far, they realized that their fates might have been sealed long before this moment. With a heavy heart, Ella stepped forward. I'll stay, she said softly, her decision made with a mix of dread and determination. Nathan, you must go forward. Find the truth, and maybe, in finding it, there's a way to free me. Nathan protested, his words a mix of despair and anger, but Ella quieted him with a sad smile. It's the only way, she insisted. One of us needs to see what's beyond, and one of us needs to make sure they can. This is my choice. Before Nathan could argue further, Ella turned to the voice in the shadows. I am ready, she declared, her voice echoing in the silence. The ground trembled, and the chains on the gate rattled violently. Slowly, the padlock unlocked itself with a loud click, 
falling to the ground with a heavy thud. The gates swung open, revealing a pathway that glowed with an unnatural light, leading into realms unknown. Nathan, tears streaming down his face, embraced Ella tightly, whispering promises to find a way back for her, to undo this cruel fate. Ella held him just as tightly, her own tears mingling with his. Go, she whispered. Find the answers we need. And never forget. With one last look, Nathan stepped through the gate, the light enveloping him, pulling him forward. Behind him, the gate swung shut with a resounding clang, and the mist swirled around Ella, embracing her as its new guardian. The voice in the mist whispered to her now, a constant companion in her eternal vigil. You have chosen bravely, it murmured. Perhaps, in time, you will come to understand the true nature of sacrifice. As Nathan disappeared into the light, the scene faded to black, leaving viewers with a haunting tableau of love, sacrifice, and the unending quest for knowledge. Ella, now part of the mist, watched over the threshold, a silent sentinel bound to the secrets that lay beyond, while Nathan ventured into the unknown, carrying with him the hope of liberation and the heavy burden of their shared destiny. The story paused here, a cliffhanger that left the door open for a journey into the deeper mysteries of the universe, the nature of reality, and the power of human connection, a tale to be continued, where the boundaries of horror blur into the realms of the profound.